to, to, to two people whom I've been in contact with probably over the years at some stage or another. Um, because I'm going to be introducing the fiction people and um, the fiction contributors to Chrono 54. And, um, you know, you, a lot of you have very uh, extensive bios. So um, I just took a sample or two out of each of your bios because of, of time uh, restrictions, because this is going to go on for a couple of hours. And um, so I'll start at the beginning. And the first to start proceedings, I'm afraid, is uh, Mark Donovan, as I've warned him already. Uh, Mark hails from England, and uh, he's an accomplished writer. And he um, he won the, well, he was shortlisted, actually, for the Colum Tobin International Short Story Award. And today, his story is titled The Tsunami, or Tsunami, actually. So over to you, Mark. Thank you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I'm one of those people who's benefiting from the Zoom because of the geographical distance. So I'm based in London, but you can probably hear from my accent. I'm actually originally from Donegal. So I'm just going to read an extract from uh, my story, Tsunami, by Mock Donovan. Scars map the steelworks, cold sea black, relentless, but passionless. She wants to shout at the sea. She wants to shout at anyone, really. Where has all the passion gone? Lemon top, wind farms and the campaign, the love she feels for her people, the northeast of England, even the North Sea. It's too calm for her liking, as though important things aren't happening, as though the world isn't being turned upside down. She sees a world beneath the sea, a time when there was a land bridge to Europe, animals roaming across the plains of Doggerland, people building fires, sheltering for something greener, what was that? new lands. But it's just a sea, a lake even, if you stretched your imagination. Britain as part of the continental landmass, the sea an unfortunate accident. What if she drained it, recovered the land underneath? Who would own that? Is there a country there willing itself into existence? You knew, knew it all, what's new? The tabloids as predictable as ever. At least in red car, people let her go about her business as though she's still one of them, as though she isn't somehow responsible for the mess they're in. She can see the censure in their eyes, but they hold back the criticism and for that, she'll always be thankful. Dylan brings her a coffee, then they sit in silence for a while. The turbines bowing and scraping. Steelworks haunting the horizon. The breeze tiptoeing around them as they sit on a bench and try to think of something to say. Something that isn't too obvious. Dylan speaks first. This will all blow over. She feels her body sinking then, collapsing in on itself, replaced by tears. This is everything she's ever feared. She looks around, self-conscious. It wouldn't be good to have her snots and tears all over the front pages. The press will be out there somewhere, even in red car, in the place where she feels safest. Thank you. The lovely reading. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that. And um, now the next person that I'm going to call on is uh, Katie Finnegan. Now, Katie Finnegan was born in England and lives in Ireland. Now she too has had many literary successes, including being shortlisted for the Bridgeport Prize. Her story is called Last Night on Earth at the LNL Tavern. Katie, is she there? Thanks, Chair. Okay. Yeah. Um, How are you? So yeah, I'm talking from my house here in Tipperary, but um, the story I'm about to read is actually set in a very dark, dingy dive bar in Chicago, um, a place that I may or may not have frequented when I spent some time there a couple of years ago. So um, I'll just read you a short excerpt from my story. Uh, Last night on earth at the LNL Tavern. Since she first heard about the colony on Mars, she was absolutely certain it was for her. She began by subscribing to their newsletter and soon started investing in the Earth so she had transferable skills. 
Her company had even encouraged her to apply to set up a presence on what they joked would be their furthest satellite office. The idea appealed to her. After all, Earth had reached its point of saturation and the people who could, those without health issues, without families, without anything to weigh them down, had a responsibility to go. There was no gravity on Mars, but that's the way she had always lived her life. Every night when she closes her eyes, she pictures that desolate landscape, like a desert in the dead of night. The red earth, the nothing colored sky, it has a serenity that breaks her heart, a kind of profound blankness that soothes her in a way she doesn't fully understand. There are no footsteps on the sand, there is no breeze to disturb the perfect stillness of the place. Only a colossal aching loneliness, so vast it sucks the emotion from those living under its dome, piercing you with its hollow echoing beauty and leaving behind a pleasurable numbness, a sense of divine detachment each time she entered the lottery. Recall that she had been selected? Well, the feeling was like nothing she had ever experienced. Like I said, she smiled. I feel very lucky. Thanks, Katie. That's Thanks. lovely. And I can remind anyone that who wants to hear, of course, it was really interesting. We're all down to hear the end of it. So you can read them all in panel, obviously, you know that already. Um, now, the next person I'm going to introduce is uh, Jessica Green. Now, Jessica is from Dublin, and um, she has featured, she has been published in Mythlexia and um, The Attic. Now, her story is called Something Rich and Strange. So we're going to hear it. So um, I'm uh, reading from my story, Something Rich and Strange. Um, and it's about a, a woman whose adult granddaughter has taken her to the beach. The hiss and splash of waves on the sand is a sibilant rhythm, a soft in and out like the breath of a sleeping child. I think of Laura when she was small and I ache for her, even after all these years. I see the curls of white crests and the tide line slinking up the shore. The empty expanse of sand is smooth near the edge of the tide, rippling into hillocks further back. The scattered clouds are golden pink against the blue, and I feel the gentle warmth of a summer evening. We used to get burned, I say. We'd slather ourselves in sunscreen, but still end up all red. Helen makes a face of sympathy. She has never needed to wear sunscreen. I want to tell her that it was part of the fun coming home cooked to lobster colour, even the scratchy pain of the sand on your sunburn. But she knows about the melanoma I had removed from my face two years ago. I feel the sand shifting under my feet, getting firmer towards the tide line. I bend and pick up a handful of it. I peer at the tiny specks of dark and white and red, the golden glints in it. I let the grains trickle through my fingers. It used to cling ev to everything, get everywhere, this will not be a problem today. I listen to the distant call of gulls and the murmuring of waves. I can just barely feel the fine spray of ocean on my face. The light hits the sea, the line of the horizon. I breathe deeply. I want to fill my lungs with ocean air. I could almost forget myself and feel long ago freedom. I could almost start to walk along the unending shore, discreetly guaranteed not to repeat material for 10 kilometers. I take in more gusts of the air. I realize what is standing in the way of my surrender. The experience is so very nearly real. So much work has gone into getting every detail exactly right. But smell is elusive, evocative. It's hard to describe why it smells wrong. The salt water and seaweed and breeze is there. But there was always a hint of something rotten in the sea. Something less salubrious was mixed in there the edge of a stench of fishy decay, seagull shit, dead crabs, the tang of oil that polluted the water, corrupted nature. In this careful blend, it has been sanitized. It is a pleasanter smell, but it's not right, not real, it gives it away. I can't let myself go, can't give in to belief and be. That sweetness cloys in my nostrils and the whole scene seems overly perfect. Get me out of this, I shout, until Helen shuts it down and we are back in my room. The care team rush in to check if I'm okay. Have I had a stroke? I have not. What was it? What happened? The smell, I fumble for the words. It's not right. The doctor tries to explain how the olfactory processing is simulated. It's just that it was quite expensive and it was booked for three hours. 
Helen tries to contain her annoyance. Thank you, Jessica. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Thank you. Um, now we have Carol McGill. Uh, she's a writer from Dublin, and her work appears in many publications, um, including Words to Words to Tie to Bricks and Brilliant Flash Fiction. Now the title of her the short story that she'll be reading extracts from tonight is Mine Tonight. So Carol, please. Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you so yeah. much to Cranog for organizing um, a launch. It's lovely to have some kind of launch at the moment. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, the story is called Mine Tonight. The train station was almost deserted. Siggy shifted from one high-heeled foot to the other, knuckles white and fingers slick on her back. Her dress fell too short and too young on her. It was nearing midnight on the 31st of October. When the train rumbled into view, Siggy's heart pounded with relief and fresh anxiety. It was almost empty, same as usual, maybe five people in the first three carriages. She tried to control her expression as it shuddered to a stop. Cindy dismounted from the carriage with the same tentative step as last year and the year before. She saw Ziggy and managed a small, strained smile. Ziggy caught her in a tight hug. She let go more quickly than she wanted to. She knew from experience that this needed to be as normal as possible, though it shared with her every year to realize that she was taller than Cindy now. It's good to see you, hon, she said. It's good to see you, Zig. Cindy almost whispered in that muddled sort of way. She was always a bit confused, fresh off the train, almost dizzy. In some ways, it was a good thing. It stopped her questioning how she'd got there. Ziggy linked their arms and Cindy's bracelet clinked against her own. She led the way down the platform, the grease of the tiles sucking on their boots. It had been years now since Ziggy had found the station. That first Halloween, she'd bought herself a bottle of vodka and gone into town with no makeup and no plan. She'd been sitting on a bench in Temple Bar, crying and ignoring her phone, when an older woman stopped and asked what was wrong. Ziggy had seen her once or twice in the years since, but they'd always avoided eye contact. When Ziggy told her, the woman stared at her for a minute, then said, you'd better come with me. The woman had taken her to the train station. Going to leave it there. Thank you for that, Carl. Thank you. Um, now, the next person I'm going to call on is Corbin Muck. Now, Corbin Muck is a freelance writer from Seattle, so we're going across the Atlantic to, uh, to meet him. Uh, the title of his short story is The Deepness of the Land. So, um, Corbin. Thank you. Hi, all. Honored to be here and fun to see so many other people from Seattle in here as well. So, great. Um, and my piece is this, it's kind of about a, a tryst gone bad, basically. So when I tried to speak, my voice sounded hoarse. You smiled, you nodded, you implored me to more, but we both knew it was because you hoped that words were the waves you expected. But my words are not waves. They are cairns I arranged behind myself to mark where I have been. Sometimes they can be thrown forward to land in the sea or the inscrutable understory but those are soon lost. The words that stick are the words which fall just near us, land, settle, and move on to the next. You hated those words as they accumulated, as they began to fill in on top of one another. When comes the wave? When comes the clean new meanings? No wave comes for me. I am ever building, somewhere between dung beetle and mountain. You walked the halls when I slept, what few there were. You overlooked everything that, like my words, had accumulated aside me. There were pictures, there were papers, there were books, there were paintings and scrawlings, there were smooth handles and chipped metal. There were barnacles that had gathered so long I had mistaken them for the wood of my craft. I sheared away at the other things, the new things that took, my hands scarred. I knew as I watched you move in the cabalic darkness of the trees and sky that your tide had come. I saw you now at your crest to me. You mourned. It was not what you imagined, but you had imagined so much and the land is not the sea. I wish then, as I do now, that I could shift first at your waist and spread across your body like water, 
that I could fight or enhance your strokes, that I could wash over and past you as much as I press upon you and be borne upon hot climbs of distance. But I cannot. I sit, I build, and I gather. Your eyes find me the same way they find the cell remains of a long dead whale. Once something, now calcium for the otherly alive sea floor, a cathedral of bone for cannibals. Thanks. Thank you, Corbin. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah Salway uh, hails from England, and she is a former Canterbury laureate. And um, we're, uh, which sounds very um, interesting. Uh, she has uh, written three, um, the author of three novels and a short story collection. And her story tonight is called All Spoken For. So, um, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so it's called All Spoke For. Manners. We eat lunch in the dining room on Sundays, all six of us round the table, father, mother, two brothers, two sisters. Sometimes grandparents, uncles, aunts and cousins join us, but never friends because this is family time. As the youngest, it is the best time of the week for me. For once, no one is allowed to have better things to do. Sometimes I even let my fingers float out to touch my brother or sister sitting next to me. Mum, Laura's touching me again. I withdraw my hands, let them rest with floppy wrists on the edge of the table. Never elbows, that's bad manners. In front of me, the spoons are facing the forks, knives pointing out, glasses on the right. I even love the ritual of laying the table. So much order to get right. FHB. We have our own common language about food. We all know when mum says FHB, we have to wait for visitors to help themselves before we can tuck in. We call pudding, pudding afters because for some reason it annoys mum and overpronounce a hard A in strawberries and raspberries to mimic dad's accent. When dishes are finished, we say they are all spoke for, haha, -ha, but none of us remember why. But we all eat our food differently. Dad works his way through the plate from left to right. My mother waits until we've all started before beginning her own. My oldest brother, George, always asks for as much as possible of everything. And my second brother, William, can't eat anything until he has smelt it. As for me, I have always copied my older sister Annie's tastes before I even think about developing my own. Annie and I don't like fish, could eat marmite by the spoon, can taste custard even when it's hidden in trifle. Although soon it seems we don't like pudding at all and we don't eat potatoes or crackling or cake. cake. We'll never have seconds even when we're hungry. Then one day I'm trying to follow what my brother is saying when I realise that Annie has stopped eating. Even the small bit of roast chicken breast she took has been half pushed under a lettuce leaf. The Rock Cake Man. Dad is always on diets. They never last more than a day or two, but one month he has done exceptionally well. The only problem is that he isn't losing weight. Dad, it seems, has a slow metabolism. Metabolism. I've reached the stage when I would eat words if I could, and this one feels particularly delicious. Then one day when mum, dad and I are in the car driving home, mum decides she wants to stop at a ro roadway cafe for some tea. Dad tries to get her to wait until she's home, but she can't understand why he's being so difficult about it. As we walk into the cafe, the woman behind the counter shouts out, it's the rock cake man. It turns out that dad hasn't been losing weight because he's been eating so many rock cakes that he's been given his own nick nickname. But how did you ever think I wouldn't find out? Mum keeps asking. Dad's not clever like Annie, but then it's the fact that she's not eating that Annie's so good at hiding. Mum doesn't seem to have noticed. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry for the confusion. Lovely reading.
Uh, the last fiction contributor tonight is, and I think, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing this right or not, Beate Sigridotter. And Beate is from New Mexico. And actually, she's our second laureate tonight after you, Sarah. Um, and she was port laureate in Silver City, New Mexico. Um, she has, I think she has a short story con uh, collection actually coming out in 2021, so best to look with that. And her story tonight is titled, I Didn't Know What to Say. Uh, so am I right in pronouncing it, Beate? Yeah. Yeah. From okay. Fredericton, New Brunswick, Atlantic Canada, and I'm so happy to be once more at a Cranel Blanche. It's a, a delight. Um, I'm going to start with the poets, and uh, there are a lot of poets, so I won't have time to give a, a bio, but uh, they're all listed here in the Cranel magazine. So to begin with, uh, we have uh, Sarah Backer who is from New Hampshire in the United States with her poem, Waves. Sarah. Hi, it's so nice to um, see you, Tony and Jer in person Hi. from all the emails we've sent over the years and um, delighted to be reading. Who knew that, that the phrase unmute yourself would be the key phrase of the past year, but we should all <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, is, I, I'm just saying this, is, are, am I coming through? Are the levels okay? Is it yeah. great? Okay, then I will just read my poem titled Waves. What made the tide that sprang last March knock out the first of two posts in the pier dug deep in sand? My father's death reopened investigation of our disappointment. Two waning tides responding to withdrawal by withdrawing. Our distant conversations, his rain, my snow. I never mentioned cancer, nor did he. He was an engineer who liked neat and precise, yet he approved of oceans. He died on a remote shore, ashes poured into Pacific waves. <sighs> so many ways to scavenge a beach, so many interpretations of broken sand dollars, beer cans, agates, kelp. The beach is vast, inconstant, inconsistent, every visit different. Gritty wind, blinding sparkle, stoic barnacles, grasping anemone. The tide draws lines in the sand, and crosses them over and over, herding minnows into shallow surf, slapping pilings in the thonic underworld beneath the battered, tilted dock that still stands a useful landing for a hungry gull. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was lovely. Uh, the next poet I'd like to introduce is Neil Banks. He's from County Wicklow, and his poem is titled Where I Be in Dreams. Neil. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you everyone at Cran Oak. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. It's nice to see everyone. This poem is called Where I Be in Dreams, and it's for Paula. Lunch break finds disgruntled me sat solo in some generic coffee franchise with a window on one of Dublin's lesser vistas, more dismal for a veil of rain. It's not the worst city, but there are days, days when humdrum meets despair for breakfast and fantasies of other places push to sell themselves as realistic goals. A lad brings my food, this faux croque monsieur, their only menu choice anywhere close to where I'd be in dreams, which is lunching with you, love, in that Paris brasserie on Croque Madame, Pommes Frites, Van Rouge, and no care for time, money, or weather's caprice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Jason Barry. 
and he's coming to us from Beijing and he has a poem called Life is Elsewhere. Jason. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. Delighted to be uh, at, at Cranach uh, and wishing that I were with you all or those of you who are there in, uh, in Galway. Um, this is Life is Elsewhere. Back in Boston, the weather predictably appalling, leaves mounting on the frozen street and someone's jack-o'-lantern, cheeks sunk, the crescent eyes lined with flecks of mold, waiting to be smashed. What am I doing here? The question Rambo asked in Harar, wind swept and wild in that gated Muslim city and where I'd also settled after several beat up buses, fleas and bardar, axum, gonder. My health was menaced, terror came, and when I woke, the dark dreams continued. Rush hour in Alston. On the corner of Commonwealth and Harvard, a man preaches scripture to the hydrant, swipes at bobbing pigeons, a flock of college students huddled after class, peck at glowing cell phones when they walk. The letters say he wanted to return, that Harar was the place he felt at peace. Goodbye marriage, goodbye family, goodbye future. His leg cancer ravaged, the ward in Marseille covered in wet snow. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. That was so nice. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, T. Clear. Uh, she is from Waterford, and she has a poem for us called Blue. Thank you so much. I am so delighted to be here, um, even if it's still morning in Seattle. Blue. If I say I'm going to paint my house goat, it doesn't mean I keep a goat in the house, but that I'm going to paint it a certain gray tone found on page 57 of A Dictionary of Color, copyright 1930. Yet that would be a lie because I already painted it starch or Daphne or maybe Zenith, hard to tell. Everything hinges on the light, how lagoon becomes iceberg, and virgin sheds innocence to afterglow as a cloud conceals the sun. Some mornings I awaken to opal and come home to slag. In a drizzle, king's blue fades to peasant, all so slippery. I want to say that my house is Aphrodite, that it's Versailles and love in a mist, but that old goat keeps showing up stays the winter, lingers into July, and here I am, a year older. Thank you. And thank you. Okay, so also from County Waterford, or from Waterford, um, is, sorry, yeah, I said you were from Waterford, you're from Seattle. Okay, next we have um, Colette Colfer uh, from Waterford with a poem called Bergy Seltzers. Thanks, Sandra, and thanks, uh, Cranog. It's lovely to be published in this issue, and the cover is amazing. Uh, if you do hear shouting, it's my 10 year old next door playing Minecraft, so apologies in advance, but hopefully he won't. This poem is called Bergy Seltzers. If your heart goes Arctic dark, under winter's tilt of northern all day nights, fling its still beating seed into the freezing sea. So it blooms an iceberg with crusted pinnacles that whistle and plumb deep underwater mountains of bluey crystal peaks. Then continue living apart but entangled with your heart particle, whose hulking hidden mass will rip out seams in ships. Spring will come singeing sun along the horizon, licking waves of sea, salt sea to crack webs dismantling bits of bergy seltzer. The sun will spin higher, 
pierce the shadow and split your ice ridge tip to base, making a winged expanse of iridescent glass. Some say you're broken, others that you've opened, as your ice melts with size and leaves your heart bobbing red ripe in the ocean. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to uh, Martina Dalton, and she has a, a poem with an Osquelga title called uh, Wignes, and she can explain what it is. And uh, Martina is from County Waterford. Martina. Thank you so much. Um, it's a joy to be here. It's not quite the crane bar, but it's gorgeous uh, nonetheless. Um, this is a poem I wrote uh, in County Kerry, um, just outside uh, a famine house that I came across. And I thought initially that what I felt was loneliness, but um, it wasn't quite that. And I found that the word that suited the whole situation and the sadness of it was actually Oignus. And this is a poem. Oignus. A word they flew from, cut from their mouths, they held it in their pockets, on coffin ships, kept it warm to introduce at parties for the dead. Where are they gone? Their stones stacked up in sentences I can't understand. On an island built for it, a tongue abandoned. The things they whisper to me now, between the cracks in stones, slip between my teeth, escape my tongue. Their word for loneliness, a blanket word, does not begin to cover it. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Uh, now we'll go to uh, County Down and uh, Tim Dwyer with his poem, Wheaton Toast. Thank you, editor. It's always great to be in Galway, even if virtually. My mother was from Gort, my father from near Loch Ray. My oldest sister is up there in Rahoon. I'm dying to see her, so hopefully see her soon. And this poem is dedicated to Dennis O'Driscoll. Wheaton Toast. I dreamt of a ghost fussing in the kitchen, sky dark, clatter of dishes in the pantry. Downstairs, mid-morning, the house is empty. The living have gone to the shore. The toaster warms my face. Spread of melted butter, blanket of marmalade, cup of French pressed coffee. In the red ceramic fruit bowl, paper brown onions enhance the brilliance of oranges from Valencia and the surprise of garlic cloves in their otherworldly purple. Then, unseen by human eye, a small sprig of happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, next, we have uh, someone from Cavan. Uh, we have Kate Ennals and her poem, The Onset of a March Night. Great. Thank you very much, Sandy and Cranog, for having me and publishing the poem. Uh, the Onset of a March Night. Coke cans and sweet wrappers start my close of day stroll in the grey brick alleyway over the road, passing the low-walled gardens of the crescent moon estate. I admire the blue delphiniums, the yellow forsythia upright and straight. I cross the grassy field over to the lake. A misshapen orange sun carves up clouds into slivers of pink before it dips behind the shadows of drumlins on the far side. At the water's edge, raised shadowy branches of 20 poplar trees weave their lime-budded branches into the sky, into a loom of purple and gold to spin spindles of dusk. 
out of this spill, voices of dark shaped children peel and chime. They kick their last ball across the green before being called in. In the growing quiet and gloom, the lakeshore reeds bow their heads to protect the nests of the water birds who flutter and squawk. At six o'clock, a stream of headlights turn into the estate, one after another. People switch on windows of light, while over the rooftops in the inky sky, the starlings rise to murmur and scrawl a coda to the end of day. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have someone I know from the night people, the Kuru people. Uh, it's the tractor Fahi from County Galway. Miss Landy, thanks a million. Um, it's lovely to be published in Cranog, it's, um, and particularly that it's a Galway magazine. So I want to thank the editors for including my poem, and it's a privilege to be here. It's a wonderful launch. And my poem is called October Sun. From her garden, she hears in the distance winter geese heading northwest, starlings on the nearby pole. Late afternoon, her thoughts on the lake, an October sun breaking beneath cloud over its surface. A flap, a family of mallards lifting from reeds, green damselfly flashing. The call of the curlew beckons the evening light in rays of silver on water, bird noise in the nearby wood. She'd like to walk across fields, pick blackberries, the grass damp, briars grown over the wall, tangled in barbed wire. She watches from her window, fallen leaves on her grass, auburn trees, a path to the shore's edge. Her eyes follow over fields she knew. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Orla Fay. Uh, she's from, from she's from uh, County Meath, and her poem is titled "Optimism Dressed as Joy." Hi everyone. It's great to be here at the launch of Cranog Fifty Four. So thanks to the editors Sandra Jar. Charlotte and Tony, and I love the cover as always. And I'd be a liar if I didn't say that this wasn't um, inspired by Emily Dickinson, Hope is the Thing with Feathers. And it's called Optimism Dressed as Joy. Hope is the smallest thing, a dark stone turned over to reveal a lighter gray, the sunlight appearing from behind cliche cloaked cloud, the biblical rainbow, the snow drops in January, the premature daffodil bulbs, their yellow trumpets. Hope is a promise of nothing existing, neither true nor false, its clothes are invisible. Some say it is the dawn, be chosen in the morning, to be rebirth, an ability to see another way of seeing a state of mind. It is freshness, the spring, something that can be kept in pocket, a non-perishable, a trinket. It is fleeting, a warmer shade of despair. It is what it is to be human, longed for water and thirst, something old suddenly found, the promise of a journey, a future, a smile forming on lips. Thank you. Thank you, Orla. And the last introduction for me is uh, Laura Fowley, Foley, and she's from Vermont, and her title poem is Speaking Meadow. Thank you so much, and um, it is lovely to, to hear all the voices, all the accents. I feel uh, transported to different parts of the world. I love hearing the different slices of nature. This poem is set in Vermont in walking distance from my house is a hill. And certainly during COVID, um, I have already clocked almost 2000 miles of walking within my own um, neighborhood. So um, 
This is called Speaking Meadow. Above the hermit thrushes, flute-like rush of descending minor notes in a high field where butterflies sip from clover, goldenrod sways on stems grown longer than thought could make them, where oats grow even taller, where two dogs tired from a steep hike sleep in soft grass, where a breeze arises, ruffles the leaves, where time has aged the barley from luscious green to delicate dry beige. A humans come to feel the day's change from sun slant morning to wide spread of midday heat, to rest above the world of naming, among the no less articulate meadows, birds, insects, stones, flowers. Thank you very much. So we've heard for, from some wonderful, wonderful poets and some gorgeous poems, and I'll hand you over to Jarla now to introduce some more. Hi everybody, my name is Jarla, and uh, good to be here, and great to see everybody, and uh, it's particularly great to see Sandy there after such a long time. Um, uh, on my first reader uh, on my list is uh, Kevin Graham, and uh, He's from Dublin, and I'd let him introduce his poem. Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, great to be here with everyone. Um, Orla mentioned Elizabeth or Emily Dickinson, so I'm going to take a little bit of her um, lead with, with a little quote on this poem called Trist. Uh, so Emily says in the poem, Futile the winds to a heart in port. Trist. The air is blue as melting smoke. Calm shades the grief, slips through pine trees like a ghost. There's comfort in the loaded web, how it clings despite everything. Needles soften in the dark. There could be patterns blooming and a moon hiding its face were it not for you shoegazing on the gravel path to the sea, waiting for love to lift a latch and come unbidden like a vole or sandpiper, lost penitent, wreathed in sweet mystery. She stands like a frozen wave in a figure of glass, roses pressed neatly on her dress. She dips slowly like a knife, appears to be a source, owls hoot in the everywhere darkness, the frost bites. Desire slips from the mind's eye to touch fierce skin, breath wintering into summer, into clarity. Thank you. Lovely, Kevin. Thanks very much. Uh, the next reader is Richard Halperin from Paris, or France, I believe. Hello. I hope the sound is all right. It's great. The poem is called Silence. And so I won't say anything about it. I'll just read it. I look at a photograph of a planet. I think it is Jupiter, perfectly round, striated horizontally with bands of color, immense and weightless, incomprehensible, as our crabs scuttling sideways, as our stones I cannot hear any of these because they speak at different speeds from mine. Planets speak so slowly that rocks cannot hear them. When you died, I thought Jupiter. I thought crabs scuttling. I thought mercy because I do not know what any of these things mean. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Richard. Beautiful. And the next 
speaker, our uh, poet is Keegan Hawthorne from, let me see, get it right, New Brunswick. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thanks to uh, Cranog and everybody for such a wonderful, uh, wonderful launch. It's, it's a, a privilege. The poem I'm going to read is called Grief, um, and there's a word in here, bin, and that refers to the, the giant house-sized grain bins that they have on the Canadian prairies. It's a, a prairie poem. So it's called Grief. You go to step outside yourself and cannot find the door. Then notice, too, the windows gone because there are no longer any walls and the wind is blowing and on it the smell of rain. But afterwards, it is never like a storm. At best, a small breeze silvering the willows down by the dugout. Leaf by slender leaf, their under veins, their petioles. At worst, it's like the thickening of calm before storm air through which you wade while all around the others pass unheeding of the sudden waxy light, the threat of electricity on the phone lines. Grief is the thing that lurks unsummoned in the hovels of the night, rattles windows in the cellar that no one knew were there. But there was that day out beyond the northmost bin the polished nut of you hard and naked to the sky, an open gate through which it all might pass, unaltered and unaltering. It was the same then as love, the love of him, the grief of death, the same as all the other things it could never be again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keegan, lovely. Uh, the next uh, uh, reader is Rita Joyce from Tipperary. I take my banishment willingly. Welcome all that is untamed outside these garden walls. I open my arms to bouquets of foxgloves whipped by a northern wind. Gather cowslips trampled in a herded field. Unchained daisies that cower low in ditches. I bend and hold the fractured china cup that fell from the dresser when the dancing pumped. I admire the stains, the swirling cracks that remain. I welcome the storm at sea that lashes the pier. Walk closer to the edge than considered wise. Unhook my anchor and roll furiously from the cove. In an unsound harbour, I set up camp, not caring what's in store, and enjoy the sweetest of apples. I am shameful no more. Thank you. Thanks very much, Breda. Thank you, Charlotte. Thanks, everyone. Now, then, thank you. The next reader is Emily Lindstrom, and she's all the way from Italy. Are we there? Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hello, I'm Emily. I hope everyone is safe and in good spirits wherever they are or have access to some. <laughs> um, I don't want to hold up the line, but I do want to thank Cranach for publishing me, and I'm very grateful to be listening to everyone's work tonight. So I give you my poem, Heirloom. It's time to return to the old country, retrieve my offerings from the base of the mountain where funeral processions wind up and down all day and women say their prayers before and after copulation. Then I can wear long skirts again and drink from rivers and love crude men without a thousand tongues and letters telling me I deserve better. We deserve only what we want. I will grow my hair long, let the dye run clean, stroll pale and blonde along the docks. I will take sailors home to bed, bathe them in my tub to bottle up their salt again. I will drink from them when I am lonely. I will grow ripe and give birth to changelings, plant a garden of almost children and like cabbages eat my education. 
I will erect altars, dozens the color of pigeon's blood and Catholic blue and yellow like a yoke, like a sexless newborn's nursery room. I'll burn candles down and drink from their glasses, drink strong whiskey and homemade punches till I've driven off the last of my ancestors waiting at the door on their haunches, pleading with their eyes to forgive, to forgive. This is why there's an ocean between us and depths and a voyage and sunken selves. Over there, it's always dusk. Over there, the men must break their women in like horses, like shoes, like anything that propels you forward, moves. Where I come from, it's always the hour of the witch of peering over one's shoulder to glimpse the face of her future husband. They never see themselves, those women, only perfection, their perfect selves transformed into another. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, that was beautiful. And uh, the next reader is Anne-Marie Maher and she's from Waterford. Thank you. Hi, uh, how are you? Uh, thanks a million for having me tonight and it's brilliant to be part of this evening. Um, and for my poem, we're going back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, so it's called In the Garden. I waited for her all that long winter, curled inside a flower bud on the tip of an outreaching branch. When the sun grew warm on my back, I unfurled opened myself to the sky and its creatures. I drank of the rains, basked in the sun's hot breath, grew full-bodied. By the time the first leaves turned, I was full as a clot, bowing low over my fallen sisters. She entered the garden that morning as if from a dream, her hair haloed in mist. The sun burnt white on her pale skin, made it gleam with a celestial glow. I danced in rhythm to the swing of her hips. She placed her nose to my skin and with a twist of her wrist, sweet release. I lay in her palm, blood on snow. When night kissed our skin and the trees were cloaked with the wings of crows, she stepped lightly through the shadows made a bed of the softest mosses, feathered with fennel fronds, adorned with balsam, coriander and clove. She caressed my curves in the lengths of her hair, her fingers moving like a bed of snakes. I couldn't resist her bite, the moon of flesh it exposed mirrored in the night sky. She ravished me then, my skin, my flesh, my seeds, their weight now hers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Marie. Now, the next reader is Terry McDonough, and Terry is from Mayo. That's right, just down the road. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, everybody at Cranoke. Uh, it's a great pleasure to read here this evening. The poem I'm going to read is called An Ode to a Missing Manuscript. The gardener is not always the gardener, said the policeman, doing his best to calm the good lady after her poetry manuscript had gone missing. She'd fought off flu and comfort to complete it, and she'd been so proud and vocal in the cafe, where the pizzas and cappuccinos were just about the best ever. The place was awash with eager artists. Her smug cat on the balcony had seen or heard nothing, of course, typical tomcat. She suspected the loose-fitting Bavarian who couldn't write, but who hung about suggesting he'd sing, sketch or stay over. She stopped to let her thoughts catch up. Somewhere in, a liter in literary magazines, she'd Google a dead giveaway line and she'd pounce and pin that plagiarist to the trunk of the next lively breeze until he, she, or it coughed up to the chanting of chainsaws. She was wild. Her later work had an edge to it, critics said. 
Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Terry. Very good. And the next reader is Linda McKenna. And Linda is from Down. Hi, everybody. Uh, lovely to be here. Thanks to everybody in Cran Oak for including my poem. Um, it's a lovely launch and fantastic book with great illustrations. And I've really enjoyed all, all your readings tonight. Um, this is Burr. Burr. Once full of letters never sent, unsure how to end, yours faithfully with much love. Forgiveness or called in debt, my trinket box holds brooches, pasta bracelets, green coloured pearls, a packet with baby teeth and a wedding ring. The veneer is glossy walnut burr, not created by insect infestation or virus, but the stress from a graft made to block the sap, the result prized but fragile, prone to cracking, resisting the lathe, needing instead a steady hand, painstaking matching. The pattern is the orange and brown you see when you close your eyes in morning sun. With a child, you could play a game of spotting open mouths, sheeted ghosts. It is how my thoughts might look like under glass, feathers, ribbons, knots, eyes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, the next reader is Cathy Miles, and she's from Wales, please. Hi, everyone, and thanks ever so much to Cranog. It's, it's a lovely launch, and I'm loving everybody's poems. Um, my poem, as you probably know, several icebergs have been breaking off and wandering around the ocean um, as a result of climate change. And that was the inspiration for this poem, Iceberg. He arrives unexpectedly, rafting down the currents, hitching a ride on the Atlantic drifts, a hobo with his rucksack of bulky ice. He sets up camp outside the town, grazes at the shoreline. At night, he parties wildly, bowling snowballs over waves, perfecting strike and hookshot along the shipping lanes. I hear the tuning of bassoon, deep notes of organ and tuba. In the morning, he's hungover, sweats in the sun, creaks like an ancient rocking chair. He smells of fish and polar bears, bones of fox and muskox, wintering their flesh inside him. His death is a slow ablation, his lifeblood draining down to the turbulent water. I think of how many tears are frozen within his heart, enough to drown the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy. That was beautiful. Um, next is Wendy Mooney. And Wendy is from Dublin, please. Okay, The Watcher. Ill prepared for winter, there is a howl in me. The kind of howl heard on a frosty night when foxes with coats the colour of fallen leaves roam the streets. For the light fading rapidly on the horizon, the curtained windows, the terrible endlessness of the sky. And behind it lies a door I did not open, but yet came through. Ghosts of former self crossed over. All walled in now between the walls of silence, of God knows what keeps me here in this dark space where I'm letting it all tick away. This time it's too much. And yet something sees again in me as I mend the rent in that old cotton dress of mine and in the tasseled pillow the one on which I perched in summer, the position I found myself in, cross-legged, breathing deeply, and scent of light flowing in at navel, and being raised up, essentially, to unimaginable coloured fields, blue and yellow, and all the impossible that could ever be. Dandelion clocks blurring out a view of lakeside houses, 
throne of bees. A howl, but the residue of colour, and all the impossible that could ever be. Something sees in me. How much further if what sees in me keeps watching? Where is my horizon? Thanks. Beautiful. Thanks very much, Wendy. Thank you. And uh, my last reader is Luke Morgan, all the way from Galway. How are you, Jared? Hello, everybody. Uh, it's so great to be here. Cranog were the very first uh, literary magazine to take a chance on me, and I'm uh, thrilled that they are continuing to do so. This is my poem, Relief. What secret relief to see a dog considered cute, heave, wretch, sniff, lick, and eat its still warm puke. To see the noble magpie of charcoal canvas blessed, wait for neighbors' exit, and steal chicks from their nest. To see the house cat frozen while her owner gasps for air, then return for funeral salmon in the food bin waiting there. To know this truth of nature that nature watched proves true. Beyond the fleece of others lie other beasts than you. Mm. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. Thank you. I pass you on to Tony now. Okay, thanks, Jarlath. Um, before I start with the poets on my list, I just noticed that be it uh, Sigrid Daughter, one of the fiction readers, uh, arrived late and didn't get a chance to read. So, Beate, would you like to read now before we move on to the other poets? Um, Up to. Have you got me? You've already yeah, been we, we, yeah, uh, Jerry oh, introduced you, so just just go ahead and read your your piece. You've been duly introduced. All right. Um, it is called I Didn't Know What to Say. I didn't know what to say. That's how it started. I didn't know what to say. We're sitting in the kitchen. I can't believe I am sitting here hating the man across the table. It isn't his fault but I have to hate someone and he's on hand. Why did he have to bring her here? Why did they have to visit? The smell of the tomatoes growing in the planters just out of the kitchen door is making me sick and it's not early pregnancy sick either. This is eight months pregnancy and it's hot and I feel so heavy. Sweat trickling down the side of my neck and down into my cleavage, I feel like an elephant. His name is Derek, and I keep reminding myself it isn't his fault. He doesn't know what to say either. Is he feeling sorry for me? Do you want a beer, I ask, or water? I think there's some iced tea as well. I marvel how I can even come up with coherent words. No thanks, he says lifting his glass, which contains something the color of beer or iced tea to show me he's good as far as liquids are concerned. Good because I don't want to get up. His eyes are kind, dark brown with flecks of gold and lots of crow's feet. The baby is kicking, but slowly, lazily. It is hot and I don't want to move it at all. Otherwise I'd be gone to the bedroom to lie down Better yet, to pick up a suitcase, call a cab to take me to the Greyhound station. Where would I go? She's beautiful, his Christina. Well, not his exactly. They're not married, not like me and Matt. They're just traveling together for the summer. He's lucky to have her, I suppose, except today. Today, Matt is the lucky one. I can't believe it. I don't want to believe it. Yes, yes, it's no secret that Matt and Christina were lovers once upon a time. That's not the problem here. 
once upon a time is one thing, but then when they went off together to the guest house, which we call the gazebo, but it's really a house with walls and air conditioning and white lace curtains that I made and hung up just three weeks ago in the bathroom with toilet and shower, I was paralyzed. For all time's sake, Matt said, as though asking for our blessing. Christina merely smiled, and I didn't know what to say. And you're going to have to read the rest of the story in the magazine. I am sorry that I got here late. Um, it's the time, um, whatever, but thank you for having me. Thank you, and we look forward to um, reading the rest of your story. Um, those of you who haven't got the magazine yes, run out and, and buy some copies for your friends. Uh, thank you very much. Did we get the pronunciation of your name correct? It's Beate's secret daughter. Yeah, I think we got that right. Okay, so moving on to the poems, uh, our first poet on the, the final, the final furlong, as it were, is Mary O'Donnell. Uh, Mary is from Kildare. Um, Manuth, I think, that great seat of learning. And uh, Mary's poem is called The Wind Speaks. So over to you, Mary. Oh, and thank you, Tony, Jarla, Sandra, and everybody at, at Cranog. I'm delighted to be in the journal once again. Uh, this poem was written in autumn and it's called The Wind Speaks to the Leaves. I have big news, says the wind to the leaves. I'm here to gust you down. The land has waited while you dawdled, insisting there was heat in your heart. You hung around through September, loath to admit you were feeling the months, tips flagging in the wrong light, veins too raucous in the evening sun. You flirted with fire games and lanterns, happy to consort with purple slows, last haws, finally the pumpkin. Did you think that this could last? Now you suck the last light to those failing cells, rouge up your drying veins to convince yourself the party isn't over. But I have big news, my companions. Those old men deities from winter tunnels beneath the oak will tumble you in a breath, anxious for young blood to give them life again. Forgive their rough handling as they unpick those brittle stems. One look should do it, as if you were invisible before they crush you to the ground. Surrender with good grace. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. That's beautiful as usual. Thank you. Our next reader is Jamie O'Halloran. And Jamie, I believe, is from the USA, but she now lives in County Galway, out in Uttarard. That's right. And she has a very timely poem called Easter Snapshot 1965. Hi, good evening. And uh, thank you so much. I'm very grateful to Cronald the honour of being involved, being in the magazine and, and for all these voices tonight. It's, it's uh, again, it's an honor and a pleasure. Easter Snapshot, 1965. Our dresses match and the straw hats that want to lift our chins higher than we want them raised. It is Easter and my sister and I hold out baskets like Buddhist nuns, their bowls for alms of plastic grass, foil shelled milk chocolate eggs, and something religious. Our matching dresses were hatched out of the closet with our other sisters' hand-me-downs next to the twin beds where we sleep side by side. We don't know that closest will mean only age or that we will feel between us a heaviness like the granite Mary and Martha find rolled away, that when I carry our mother's ashes, I will weep for her. This certain Easter, we don't know when I sang her to sleep on humid nights of the years we will not speak, of these days we do. 
Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, that's lovely. Our next poet is David Morgan O'Connor. Uh, David is from Dublin, and his poem is called Plan to Free. So over to you, David. No, he seems to have disappeared again. Okay, we'll come back to him. I know he said earlier that he was teaching a class until eight o'clock, but I saw his name there. Um, we'll come back to him. Um, so moving on to our next poet, he is Simon Perchik. And Simon is a poet who's been in Cranoke for many, many uh, issue, issues. And we've never actually met until tonight, which again is the um, one of the beauties of Maybe the only beauty of Zoom. So, Simon, uh, would you read your poem, please? It's called One Cup. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes, good oh. to see you. <laughs> I'm new in this WWW world, so you'll yeah. have to forgive me. <laughs> it can be difficult to navigate. And I'm also, I'm not a good reader like the rest of you. And I have to read it while I'm from a piece of paper. I can't memorize these things. And the poem doesn't have a title, but it's about, well, you'll soon find out. One cup kept empty and side by side, as if forgiveness is a service. Do when you shake the dust off and the other overflows with coffee. Heats your mouth with lips that blacken when one hand is grasped by the other and the spill Toad to where the dead overflow as evenings an entitlement that returns the darkness before the sun comes back, brings the light that once was water, fills this small cup with a morning it will clear with a soft rag, holding it close to the wooden table. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think uh, David O'Connor has come back. Um, yes, David, sorry. Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I want to apologize for loitering. I was actually teaching a class with a little earpiece listening to everyone. So I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, plan to free. This is. Um, the dog ate the turkey, then killed the village swans, piled the white corpses at the front door, impossible to hide, a pyre to be paid for with exile. In the orange school bus, each morning and afternoon, no matter the snow or dust, we'd lower the windows and hang out from the waist, yelling across the rutabaga fields and hail our dog chained to a tractor tire. We conspired to pedal, under star cover with chain cutters and hairpins to pick locks and unleash dreams. We planned escape routes down beaver creeks, flow flowing to Great Lake Mouth, over the falls to sea salt. We'd be Vikings, conquistadors, voyagers, braves, the first to find the strait. We'd live off sea pelt and whale blubber and albatross breast. We'd suck octopus tentacles to keep scurvy at bay. We'd breed a whole continent of dogs, horse islands, cat jungles, big mountains. In winter, we'd burn the news for warmth, asking for nothing, saying nothing to adults. We'd never become, which we'd never become, a fate equivalent to death. Our arms would turn legs, our snouts would grow long, fingers to paw, our ears would hear everything. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Lovely poem. Um, I forgot to mention that Simon, Simon Perchick is from New York, as is our next re reader, Ruth Thompson, also from New York, New York State, I assume. Uh, and Ruth's poem is called To Sappho from the 21st Century. Thanks so much. And it's a pleasure to be in Cranach again. Uh, to Sappho from the 21st Century. This is a response to fragment 
42, their heart grew cold. They let their wings down. Sappho, it is all disintegrating, burning, as your words burned in the fires of Alexandria. Fire, thirst, famine, flood, war, terror, pestilence. The glaciers disintegrate in shark tooth shards and from within the ice, plague and plague and plague come back to life. Once I too saw birds. Once I sang to angels, flew from joy to joy, made wings from bright air. Once we were all winged, now we watch and wring our hands. Sappho, tell me, when our hearts grow cold, when we let our wings fall, brightness fading, will any fragment stay? Lovely, thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, from New York to Donegal, for our next reader, uh, she is Mary, Tarly McGrath, and her poem is called Crossing Places. Thank you, Tony, and thank you to Cronog for including me in this magazine and in this Zoom session. Um, I'm, from I'm living in Donegal, but I'm originally from Mount Talbot on the galway roscommon border. So there's another Galwegian for you. Crossing places. The tide was in. We clambered over rocks to reach the ivory shelled sands of Kinnegar. Three sets of rocks, some huge boulders, others much smaller with split slate rocks like old gray vinyl records stacked diagonally. Among these slate rocks, splits and crevices holding damp velvety seagrass and seaweed clumps. The rocks remain pitted with barnacles, clams, limpets, tiny bird's eye shells like clusters of frog spawn with now and again in crevices, yellow and white lines of ancient quartz stripes, polished and worn. Once the tide rarely reached these rocks. Now new channels have changed the tide line. At least we can climb with care. Unlike the women who had to cross the Guibara estuary on foot at low tide before the bridge was built, carrying their bony knitting to the buyers in Glenties. When they had to wait too long for payments for jumpers, hats or gloves, the tide was in again. So they huddled in sheltered groups chatting and crossing themselves against bad weather. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much for that. Our next reader is Molly Toomey, and Molly is from Waterford. Uh, I think she's the fourth reader we've had tonight from Waterford. Uh, obviously, this uh, very creative place, Waterford. So uh, Molly is going to read her poem, Nudge. So would you welcome, please, Molly. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much um, for having me this evening as well. It's been wonderful uh, listening to everyone's work. And it's been, it's it's great to be um, in with other Waterford folks, some of whom I know and really admire. So thank you. Um, Nudge. She listens to her father log himself home. His whiskey airs a clawed, mouldering shadow coming to grip her by the throat. She stuffs her pocket with sunflower seeds, sneaks to the ragwort and yarrow, hops the barbed fence, 
to listen to the nine pound chant in the horse's chest. She palms his crest, his breath is nettle tea, cupped in her lungs. Later, she'll ease her father on his side to stop him choking on his tongue. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Hi, Molly. Thank you very much indeed. Um, back to the USA, to Vermont again for our next reader. Uh, she is Carla Van Fleet, and her poem is called Second Thoughts. Hello, everyone. It's just lovely to be here with you all and um, to hear all of this amazing work. So, Second Thoughts. Like a flock of field sparrows, I am back in the meadow, in grasses and the blue of chicory, the dappled white Queen Anne's lace. That kind of a day, always that kind of a day with you. True, I flew like a bird, I loved, I soared. The rain changed pitch in the downpour. I think of walking out my back door, walking, walking, letting myself soak through. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Carla. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, our next reader is Eamon Wall. Um, we're still in the USA, in Missouri this time, uh, although Eamon is originally from Wexford. Uh, he now lives in St. Louis in Missouri. Um, and his poem is called Osaka Oleander. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Tony, and the editors of uh, Cranog for including my poem in this issue. And congrats on number 54. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to hear all the other readers uh, this, this afternoon. Osaka Oleander. Petals of red oleander are pinned to stems as airfoil blades are to planes propeller shaped. White oleander opens as a handshake should on a red leaf path leading inland to Osaka. Oleander, we read, is the flower of Hiroshima. Kiyochi Koto, first to rise in bloom after the city had been blitzed by an gay. Citizens seeing along roadway and hillside, hopeful oleanders hue and cry, doubling under cloud. They suppose that Truman's poison would not settle down to sleep. Soon Japan revived to unsettle the USA. It is late on an August day. The building's doors are closing soon. We put our history books away. In an orange dress, mother waits in the vestibule. She likes to labor in the garden among her flowers. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Eamon. Thank you for that. And our last reader, and thank you for waiting, uh, is Dolores Welsh. And Dolores is from Roscommon. And her poem is called Love in Space Time. So, Dolores. Okay. Thank you, Tony, and all the team at Cranog. It's wonderful to be part of this, and I've so enjoyed all of your readings. Love in Space Time. That cat was a real peacekeeper. The mice in the barn knew it and multiplied. The hens moved around her freely and starlings took baths in her water bowl. She had a walk that was all her own, easy, graceful, the eloquence of being in motion. She taught me stillness, patience. That absence was a different kind of presence after you were gone. And how the long shadows spawned in an early summer dawn were indistinguishable from those at sunset, as if time had shrunk to a wormhole between both, tying us 
at the gate of the waiting to happen that was happening that had already happened. It was the morning she came into the yard back from a wilderness of upland fields deep in injury from God knows what out there. Badger, fox, ferret, pine marten, or a tom who hunted her small size down. Still, she made it, crawling on her belly past the hen house toward the back door, as if she'd sworn a secret oath of fealty to me who merely fed her, as if she'd chosen me to be nurse and custodian while she tried to regroup all the split broken bits of her, lick and seal them back into a new self. Impossible to heal, of course, with that level of injury. Though I didn't tell her this, those last pained breaths easing from the rictus of her drawn back lips as the sun climbed overhead, stricken, stripping us of all shade but yours, returned by love's grace into the world. The warmth of your hand mantling mine as we cradled her small, still skull. Thank well, you. thank you very much, Kate. Uh, that was a lovely ending to our evening of 39 readers in all. And it's been a great experience uh, seeing you all and hearing you all from so many different parts of the world. I believe we ranged from Beijing to Seattle, which must be more than halfway around the world. And uh, thanks to technology for that. Um, thanks indeed to all the contributors to Cranog. Most of you are here. Um, I think there are about four uh, who didn't read. Um, so thanks to everybody. And indeed, thanks to everybody who submits to Crano because uh, we get eight, nine hundred submissions for each issue. And without that, um, we couldn't make the magazine as, as good as it is. The more, more submissions you get, the better the, the, the quality of the finished product. So thanks to everybody who submits. And if you're not in this one, you know, uh, keep on trying, um, keep on submitting. Uh, I want to thank the cover artist, Willie Brennan, um, for uh, a very impressive uh, cover, which has been getting a lot of admiration online. Um, we're uh, revamping our website, so um, have a look out for that in the next maybe three to four weeks. It should be up and running, and it proves it, it, it should be very exciting. Um, we're very excited about it anyway. There will be lots of new features on it. So keep, keep a look out for that. Um, and again, thank you all for making this what is our first and hopefully last uh, Zoom launch of Cranog such a success. And I will ask you now to unmute your microphones and give yourselves a round of applause from everybody. So I will start. Bravo! Bravo! Oh, my dog. Uh, we've woken lots of dogs in the in the neighborhood. <laughs> be quiet. Sorry, I'm talking to my dog. <laughs> You'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, good night and thank you. Bye bye. Thank, you bye. Thank, you thank, thank you all. Thank you all very much for a great night. Thank, 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 thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, come on, let's see the dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's well groomed, sorry, he's well groomed. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lockdown groom. Oh, <laughs> oh lovely. Thank you. Yeah.
Sí. How old is it? See, then see, Jonathan. All the best to track them. Thanks. Lovely to see you, Sam. Lovely to see you. Yeah, lovely to see you. Belongs to somebody else.